Mr. Friedman is president of Old Structures Engineering, a structural engineering consulting firm for historic and old buildings based in New York City. A professional engineer with 25 years experience, Mr. Friedman focuses on in-depth investigation, analysis, and restoration of landmark buildings. Mr. Friedman's design experience includes the integration of modern construction into existing buildings with archaic and obsolete structural systems, repair and restoration of steel, masonry, iron, wood, and concrete structures, and the investigation of historic buildings to determine structural type and condition. He's an adjunct associate professor at the Historic Preservation Program at the Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture and Planning and Historic Preservation, has authored numerous articles for technical publications and professional societies, and has written five books related to construction, renovation, and engineering. Mr. Friedman holds a BS in Civil Engineering from Rensselaer, an MA in Historical Studies from the New School, and is a licensed engineer in seven states. He is certified by the Structural Engineering Certification Board. Thank you. Um, just to, for the non-engineers in the room, I'm a structural engineer and Nadal is a geotechnical engineer in our practice, if not necessarily our training. Uh, and that split is easily defined as the ground plane. I deal with stuff above grade, he deals with stuff below grade. Um, so my talk is focused mostly on the effect of uh, altering foundations, excavation, and so on, on the building above ground. Um, and the doll is going to be talking mostly about uh, how you how you go about those alterations and what their what the immediate effect of them is. Um, there is uh, there are a couple of caveats before I get started, and I think that they're important to understand. Prepared slides. Um, the first one is that there is a bit of a gap between the regulations and exactly what I'm telling you today. I will do my best to make it clear what is statutorily required and what's my opinion. My opinion is a bit more conservative than the, uh, than, the, than the regulations, so I'm not leading you into trouble if you do what I say. I'm just make, making it a little more conservative than what the regulations allow. Um, and I'll tell you exactly where I'm more conservative. Uh, about two months ago, I did a survey, um, for other reasons not connected with this talk, of our work in 2016. And we worked on about 500 buildings in our office, and one of them was new. Uh, the others were all existing structures, and 58% of them were designated landmarks of some type, and the others were not. And I can say pretty confidently that there's no difference in how we dealt with the landmark buildings versus how we dealt with other old buildings. Uh, the fact that the building is landmarked has nothing to do with its physical structure, uh, for the most part. And what affects the topic at hand today is what that physical structure is. So, for example, um, if you have a 1950s steel frame curtain wall high-rise that is landmarked, the Lever House, for example, uh, there's really no difference in how you would deal with work adjacent to that building versus how you would deal with work adjacent to a building built last week. If you have a landmarked 1880 row house and across the street you have an unlandmarked 1880 row house, you should be treating them the same. So the regulations allow more movement, among other things, in, uh, in non-landmark buildings. I'm more conservative than that. I, I do not take that into account. I look at the age of the building and its structure rather than it, its designation status. Uh, this is, in broad terms, um, the ways that, that construction adjacent to an existing building can affect it. Uh, I'm going to talk at least briefly about all of these points, um, some of them more than others, because some of them specifically supportive excavation is very much in the doll's camp, not in mine. Um, move, just to clarify what they are, movement is uh, physical movement in one direction versus vibration, which is you know, back and forth. Uh, noise is simply vibration that is audible. Most vibration in buildings is not. Uh, protection of the existing building, which is something required by the, by the building code. Um, supportive excavation, when you dig a hole in the ground, why don't the sides cave in? That is supportive excavation. Um, access during construction, it is often very desirable to go onto your neighbor's property. It's not absolutely necessary and is not absolutely required, but you're probably making a mistake if you deny your neighbor access because some of the reasons they want access benefit you. Uh, and party walls, which are something that are still occasionally created today, um, but they're basically the 19th century's gift to modern-day lawyers. Uh, a party wall is a 
A structural wall shared by two buildings typically straddles the property line, although it doesn't actually have to, um, and belongs to both buildings. So you have to either really like your neighbor or come to an agreement about what, what it means to alter that party wall. The first thing there, um, that's something that engineers get freshman year, uh, very often in a somewhat different form than the way I've said it there. there. There's no such thing as a structure that doesn't move when it's voted. Um, the example I've been using for about 20 years now is that when the wind blows, the Great Pyramid of Giza bends a little bit. Not very much, but a little bit. So if you are altering conditions, you will move everything around you. Not necessarily very much, not necessarily enough to cause damage, but don't, don't ever say to me, well, we did this and it didn't move the neighbor. No, it didn't move the neighbor enough to matter. Or maybe not even enough to be measured, but you moved it. Um, there's different types of movement. Uniform vertical movement is what's otherwise known as the building sinking into the ground. Uh, it may not cause any structural damage whatsoever. Um, if it's a small amount, people may not notice it happened. Uh, if, it, if it really is slow and uniform, the first time anybody might notice it's happening is when something like their water main ruptures. Um, if you want to see this happening, enormous amounts of uniform vertical movement without structural damage, take a look at Mexico City, uh, which is built on an old lake bed, extremely soft soil, and buildings there have undergone huge amounts of vertical settlement. I'm talking a story sometimes. Uh, and, you know, yeah, the building systems are a problem, but the structure is just fine. Uh, uniform horizontal movement is rare unless you live in a trailer, um, but it can happen. Uh, your entire building can slide sideways uh, under the right soil conditions and the right work going on next door. Again, um, if it is truly uniform, it doesn't necessarily damage the building. Uh, it is rarely truly uniform. That is, that's difficult to achieve. Uniform vertical movement is pretty easy to achieve. Deep water, soft soil, and the building will sink. Differential settlement is the thing that we see most often, and that tends to rip buildings apart. Uh, picture a typical brownstone, and the front facade is the north facade, the side walls are the east and west. Somebody's working on next to the east wall, and the east wall sinks a half an inch, and the west wall doesn't move at all. There is your differential settlement. Uh, it's going to cause a lot of damage on the interior. It's going to damage the front and rear facades. The floors will no longer be level. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it, looks horrifying. Uh, it isn't necessarily structurally dangerous, although it can be. In other words, it looks awful before it actually is awful. Uh, but, you know, part of dealing with this issue is accepting that people get very upset when their home starts to apparently fall apart around them. Uh, differential horizontal movement is much more, is much easier to achieve than uniform horizontal movement. Uh, picture excavating <coughs> that row house and the east wall adjacent to the excavation moves east. West wall doesn't. You now have differential horizontal movement. Your building's getting wider. Uh, that's going to cause a lot of cracks in the interior. And if it happens enough, uh, your joists are no longer bearing on the walls, and they collapse, and you don't have a building anymore. So except for the, the differential movements are extremely damaging in theory. Um, which is why the amount of it that you're allowed is capped by law. Um, there are two, there are basically two um, New York City Building Department provisions that matter. First is the Building Code, Chapter 33, uh, addresses um, the effect of construction and protecting your neighbors in various sections. Uh, there's also a much older, the current Building Code comes from 2014, there's a much older uh, regulation from the building department, which is now more or less included in the building code, but not exactly. The language is a bit different, so people still refer to the older regulation, and that is Technical Policy and Procedure Notice Number 10 of 1988. Uh, it is so old, it was typed, and therefore the version that is available on the web from the building department website is a scan of the typed uh, regulation. And it addresses the amount of movement and vibration that you were allowed next to a landmark building. Uh, the building and it does not address non-landmark buildings at all. Uh, the building code similarly has different regulations for landmark and non-landmark buildings. To go back to the first thing I said, uh, if you have an old row house, it really doesn't matter if it's landmark or not. If you use the allowable vibration and the allowable movement meant for a new building for modern construction, you will damage that building. So 
those are the two regulations that describe how much of this movement you're allowed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, vibration is simply you know, back and forth movement. Um, I should probably point out that amplitude and frequency are where AM and FM come from uh, because you're talking about radio waves which are vibrating. Um, the maximum amplitude of a vibration is something that in non-technical non terms doesn't matter as much. It matters because of the way we measure vibration. Uh, but if, if that were big enough to matter, your building would be a pile of rubble. Uh, and, you know, your, your, your amplitude on, your, on the vibrations is not an inch. Your building isn't moving back and forth an inch. Uh, the frequency tends to be much more damaging. Um, but those two things interact, and there are, uh, Nadal has a chart that shows exactly how they interact. I saw that in the slides. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, something that's easy to describe. Uh, and what makes it worse is that people's perception has nothing to do with what's damaging to buildings. Um, what we perceive, what we, vibrations that we perceive, and I just had this conversation with a client last week, uh, is not related to the amount of, of vibration, either in amplitude or frequency, that's necessarily damaging a building. So we have the situation all the time that someone says, well, I feel the vibration. And I don't doubt that they do. I'm sure they do. But that doesn't mean it's causing damage. And it's a very hard sell to, to talk to people about that, particularly if you're on the wrong side of this argument. So I should point out, as a way of discussion of my qualifications to be standing here, there are three possible ways you can be involved with these issues. Uh, the first one is that you are working on a renovation and you're trying to make sure your neighbor's buildings don't get damaged. I'm occasionally in that position. Uh, the second one is that you're working on a building and you're trying to make sure your own building doesn't get damaged, depending on what you're doing. Obviously, any time we do a renovation, I'm in that position. The third one is you're working for the neighbor who's worried that construction next door will damage their building. And we actually do quite a bit of that. And all I can say is that for the, for the purpose of logical consistency, I try to say the same thing in all three positions. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm right, but at least it means I can defend what I'm saying as I didn't do it just because I'm in the position I'm in. Um, so regardless of, I've, I've told clients who are next door to construction, um, yes, I know you feel it, but it's not damaging your building. And they're not any happier than when the engineer for the people next door tell them that. Uh, but it, as I said, logical consistency must, has to count for something. Um, the, by far the most damaging uh, vibrations are ones that are near the natural frequency of the building. Uh, every structure of any kind, a chair, a building, whatever, has a natural frequency. If you vibrate it at that frequency or near it, you will damage it. Uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember, Memorex used to have a commercial where a recording of a singer shattered the glass. Um, because the singer could shatter a glass by getting a note that was the, the natural frequency of the glass, and Memorex was arguing that their tapes were so good they could reproduce that frequency exactly. Uh, most brownstones have frequencies that are nowhere near the kind of, of vibration you get during construction, which is very good. Um, it means that you're not going to get that kind of damage. So. But it doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, Vibration, the other thing is that vibrations can damage any piece of a building that has its own natural frequency. So for example, the natural frequency of an ornate plaster ceiling in the parlor of a brownstone is going to be different than the natural frequency of the building as a whole. And if you have enough different pieces of the building that are fragile, you have plaster ceilings in every room, you have, um, if you actually have, still have a brownstone on your brownstone facade as opposed to stucco, uh, the stone of the facade has a natural frequency. Each piece of the building has its own natural frequency. The odds are pretty good that some of the vibration from the construction site next door will hit one of them. So you may get one piece of the building is showing more damage than another. It doesn't mean that that's where the vibration had the largest amplitude. You weren't necessarily nearest the vibration in the room that's damaged. That's the place where the natural frequency was closest. Uh, and there are ways to measure that, but they are excruciatingly expensive. So we typically are trying to determine this from secondary evidence rather than directly measuring the natural frequency of the building or of the various pieces of the building. Um, vibrations are measured by seismographs, exactly the same thing you use to measure earthquake motion. Uh, technically, what really matters, what causes damage, is the acceleration. 
if you think about a migration, you're going one way, then you're going the other. You accelerate from zero to a maximum speed, then you decelerate back to zero, then you do the same thing in the opposite direction. It's the acceleration that actually causes damage. However, that is more difficult to measure. So what we measure in our seismographs is what's called peak particle velocity. And the way I always describe this is picture a big pile of sand and you vibrate it. And the sand grains on the top are going to sort of take off and go flying. The speed that they're traveling is peak particle velocity. It's not exactly right, but it's close enough for, for discussion. Uh, so that is when you see a vibration monitor's output, what you see is uh, speed, not acceleration, velocity. Um, that's fine. It, it's, it's a single number that can be used to measure this stuff, which is very helpful, because the simpler the discussion can be made to be, the better. Noise is simply vibration that we can sense using our ears. It is vibration, there's no difference. Um, the good news is that unless you are being driven out of your house, is anybody but me getting an echo? Or is it just me? Unless you're being driven out of, out of your house by the noise, um, there is not enough energy in, the, in that particular vibration that to cause damage to the building. Um, in other words, you can transmit much more energy at lower frequencies that we can't actually hear. Uh, we can feel them, right? You feel vibration. But if you're hearing it, it's got less energy because, it, it, because if it had the same amount of energy, it would be, you'd be out of the building. You would be unable to, uh, to deal with it anymore. Um, and audible frequencies are very high and won't damage a building. Again, they might shatter a glass, but they won't damage a building. Um, there are city regulations concerning noise. I'm not going to get into them because it's not really part of today's topic. I just want to point out that this is something that is covered uh, by city regulation, by laws, um, and that certainly affects how people see what's going on. In other words, um, you can be doing everything right, but if you're causing a lot of noise all day long every day, your neighbor's going to assume that you're not doing everything right. Uh, so I do, again, when I'm on the construction side of this question rather than the neighbor side of the question, I do encourage the, the uh, contractors to try to limit noise properly um, because otherwise they're just creating bad will that hurts everybody. Not to mention annoying the neighbors. <clears throat> Um, I think that it's fairly obvious that you have to protect people from construction sites. Even if we didn't live in a litigious society, uh, it's nice to not kill people while you're doing construction work. Um, again, Chapter 33 of the Building Code spells this out in, in pretty good detail. Uh, there are various ways to protect people from construction. Um, and since we're talking about foundations today, I want to talk about the way that, that the three most common ones are sort of slot into foundation issues. Uh, the first one is simply a construction fence. Um, you know, everybody sees them all the time. Um, depending on what your excavation is, you may want to put that fence, if you're the contract, you may want to put that fence on your neighbor's property or on the street, on public property. And you can't do either one of them just because you feel like it, you need permission. So. Uh, to put a, f a sidewalk fence that chews up part of the sidewalk, uh, you need permission from the, from the city. Um, to put a fence on the neighbor's property, you need permission from the neighbor. Now, the neighbor can deny that permission. This is one of those cases where the neighbor has to decide. If you're next door to a construction site and the people who are doing the construction have just asked you to put a fence on your property, you have to decide what is what your goal is. Um, typically, that fence is not going to be running halfway through your backyard. It's going to be a foot or two onto your backyard. And it is absolutely a hardship to lose part of your backyard for your neighbor's purposes. It doesn't gain you anything. You are losing something. On the other hand, if it means that, A, they're going to get their work done faster, which may be to your benefit, less time that you're being disturbed, um, if you can negotiate that for other things, for repair or for a new fence uh, on the property line, it might be worth it. So, you know, that's not a decision I think that the professionals should ever make. What we can simply do is advise people, um, you know, yes, you can deny them permission to put the fence on your property, uh, but it's going to cause them difficulty and causing the people doing the construction difficulty tends to drag out the project. 
uh, sidewalk bridge um, is the, those scaffolds that we all see sitting on the sidewalk. Um, when there's work going on above the sidewalk, you have to have one. And very importantly, it has to extend onto your neighbor's property. And a lot of people don't understand this. Um, if, and I'm going to change the street number but not the building numbers, if the people at 3 East are building a, uh, a new building, and once they get above the sidewalk level, once they're building several stories in the air, they have to have a sidewalk bridge to protect people from falling objects if they're building directly abuts the sidewalk. Um, that bridge has to extend five feet onto the two neighboring properties, onto five and one east. Um, and the people with five and one east actually don't have any say in this. Uh, it is a city regulation meant to protect the general public. And therefore, you know, you don't want that bridge on your property or in front of your building. Um, but that doesn't matter because the point is to keep people walking down the street from getting killed. Uh, I should also point out, when I say falling objects, realistically I'm talking about falling tools or small pieces of building material. Um, if anyone has ever seen a large piece of building material hit a bridge from any height, it'll go straight through the bridge. If you lose, you get that building right behind us, if you lose one of those uh, stone veneer panels that's about six feet square off of uh, your construction site or off of a crane as it's being lifted, it's going to go through the bridge like the bridge is not even there. On the other hand, if somebody drops a hammer from 20 stories up, the bridge will save you. So it is definitely useful. It just doesn't save you from everything. <coughs> There's been discussion uh, in our office that it does save you from falling attorneys. <laughs> um, so the bridge has to be there. And I very strongly recommend to all, any client, and no matter what our position is, that you don't argue about things that are required by law because it doesn't make you look good. It, it makes the people you're dealing with think you're crazy. And if you're trying to negotiate, uh, you know, make sure that your building is safe, there are a lot of issues to be discussed. Think about it. In this small talk, I've got, I think, seven major topics. You have to talk about all of them. Arguing about things that literally are not, you can't alter, doesn't help. Uh, the last thing, again, this is required by code is to protect neighboring roofs when you get above them. Again, that doesn't directly impact on foundation excavation, um, but that is in there, that is in the building code. Um, and that's why when you see a new building going up, if you look at it from, from the air, you'll see the adjacent buildings all have some kind of, it's typically a sandwich with uh, styrofoam at the bottom and then plywood, usually several layers of wood to protect the roof, again, from falling hammers and smaller objects, not from major pieces of construction material. Uh, this, I, I'm just going to describe this um, bec because it comes into the issue of uh, movement. Um, the doll is going to get to this in some, some more length. Uh, so you're going to be excavating for whatever reason. You're making your cellar deeper. Uh, you you want to have, uh, as one of our clients did, a, a batting cage under your rear yard. Um, and you know, if anybody's ever seen a batting cage, they have to be fairly high. It's not just this elevation. Um, you need two things to create that hole in the ground. You need permanent structure, which are going to be the walls of the new cellar, or whatever, but however it's laid out. They can be foundation walls. Um, if you're in the rear yard, they may be retaining walls because they don't. There's no building on top of them. Um, that's all permanent structure that's designed by some combination of the structural and geotechnical engineers. Um, then how do you create that hole? You're going to create a hole in the ground and I'll come back to the case of solid rock in a second. Unless it's solid rock, you can simply excavate straight down because the soil will collapse. Uh, or in geotechnical speak, it will seek its angle of repose. Um, so you need some kind of temporary structure to hold the soil in place while you are building your permanent retaining structure. And that is called supportive excavation. Uh, it never used to be filed at the building department starting with the, the 2008 code. It has become standard that this is now part of every new building set, every alteration that involves excavation. So SOE has become a big deal. Uh, it's always been a big deal in terms of actually building the building, but it's now a big deal in terms of design. And if you're thinking about this issue with relation to the neighbors, if it's a big deal in terms of design, that means it's something that's going to be reviewed by your neighbors when they review your plans. Um, it's something that uh, uh, city agencies are going to be looking at. I mean, 
I've now seen the Landmarks Commission review SOB drawings, which is sort of fascinating because they don't have any engineers on staff at the moment, although I believe they're about to hire one. Um, but people want to know how this is going to affect things. Well, the SOE, the support of excavation, has a physical thickness. We draw stuff as lines, you know, but nothing is actually a line. Everything has a physical dimension. And it's not going to be a quarter of an inch. It's going to have some real dimension to it. So if the SOE is at the lot line, that means your new cellar is going to be somewhat narrower than your lot, right? If you have a 20-foot lot and you have, for the sake of argument, six inches of SOE on each side, well, your, your new cellar back there is only going to be 19 feet wide. Not a tragedy, obviously, but something that people don't always take into account. And it is really unfortunate when somebody has fallen in love with a specific idea that requires the 20-foot width, and then they find out that they can't get it on their lot. You could, of course, always ask your neighbors for permission to put the SOE on their lot. They are not required to give it to you. So again, this comes into the topic of negotiation. Um, when you are underpinning, which is explicitly extending a foundation downwards, something you need to do if you have a, uh, a deeper cellar. Um, you need a very complicated SOE because underpinning is put in in sections. If you, this is sort of obvious, but if you dug out underneath a wall for its full length and full width, the wall would fall down. So you do it in sections, and sort of alternating sections. So the support of earth is very complex around underpinning. Um, this is a problem that was solved a long time ago, but it is something that needs to be addressed and the details tweaked for each specific project. It's not, you can't just pull out the same details each time. It depends on the conditions. Uh, in that very rare case where you're sitting on solid rock, um, in theory, you can cut a vertical rock face, although you still need to pin it because that face has a tendency to buckle into the excavation. Uh, but then your problem isn't support of excavation. Then your problem is how are you removing all that rock without vibrating your neighbors to the point where their buildings fall down? Because removing rock is not easily done uh, under a building or immediately adjacent to a building. It's very easily done if you're out in the middle of a field. So um, I said before, except for if you're sitting on rock, you need SOE. In the end, even if you're sitting on rock, you need to you need to keep that rock face, the cut rock face, from buckling. Uh, so that is pretty much as far as I'm going to go on that specific topic. Um, there's a bunch of actually I, I missed one here. Access is required because your neighbor, the people doing construction, are supposed to do a condition survey of the neighboring buildings. They need to come in your building to do that condition survey. Um, now, that is one, you are not required to give access. You can actually say absolutely not. However, if you do that, you're taking on the responsibilities for the various things access would be required for on yourself. So, a person doing construction is supposed to do a condition survey of your building. If you deny them access to do that survey, you are now responsible for the condition survey for your building. Um, and Maybe you do a good survey, maybe you don't, but you've just weakened your position. If there is actual damage and you want to prove it, you don't have a survey from the people doing construction. Uh, and, okay, um, on this topic, I very firmly believe that the people doing the construction should do a condition survey. And I think they, a, a condition survey of a brownstone should contain, contain somewhere in the ballpark of 300 photographs or the equivalent of the video, but video tends to be lower resolution, so photographs are better. Uh, the reason for that is very simple. It is in their interest to document every single piece of existing damage, which is fair. If it's existing damage, it's existing damage. It is in their interest, if they're going to document it the way I just described, they're going to take pictures of everything. Therefore, if there's some undamaged plaster that later on is damaged, there's a photograph of it. Most importantly, when things get contentious, um, if the people doing construction did the survey, they can't walk away from it. They can't say, well, that survey isn't, doesn't represent the conditions because it's their survey. So I recommend, again, clients on both sides of this issue, the people doing the construction should do a survey, but it has to document the entire building. It can't be, well, I've seen surveys that have five photographs of the cellar, one of the public stair, and one of the roof, and somebody said, this is a condition survey. No, it's not. That's you know, what I did this weekend report when you're in third grade. You need to take photographs of the entire building. 
Um, and it, that is a proper condition survey. And you know, in the days of PDFs and Dropbox and whatever else, it's very easy to transmit 300 photographs to somebody. Um, so the deal I always recommend to everybody is people doing the construction do that kind of survey on the condition that they immediately make it available to the people whose building they've just surveyed. Access is required to put protection on the roof or protection uh, on a stoop or wherever else. Again, if you deny access for this, you're now responsible for protection of your building. So I don't recommend denying access. Um, I'm going to be getting to the topic of vibration monitors. I, you absolutely want vibration monitors in your building. How are you going to know if the vibrations in your building are the level that's damaging if it's not being monitored? So vibration monitor is about this big. You should allow the people in your building to install them. Typically, they get plugged in. They don't use a whole lot of electricity. Um, I'm going to come back to the third point in a minute. Access may be requested for support of excavation. As I said before, um, somebody may really want to use the full width of their lot for their new cellar uh, in the backyard. That means the support of excavation has to go on the neighboring properties. That is, you know, I'm, I'm neutral on this. Uh, the people next door have to decide if it's worth it to them, if there's something they want that they will get, uh, if they just want to be generous and allow the people doing construction to put SOE on their property. Um, obviously, the construction fence for safety has to be beyond the SOE. So, for the sake of argument, if the new foundation is going to go right to the property line, the SOE goes 6 to 12 inches past it, the fence is going to be another foot past that. You're going to lose a two-foot strip of your rear yard during construction. There might be reasons why it makes sense to you. I, I, don't, I don't get into that topic. I simply discuss what is required by code and what's not. Similarly, contractors always, you know, a brownstone site is very constrained for a contractor, um, particularly in a narrow building, a 16-foot, 8-wide brownstone, for example. It's a very tight site. So if you can get to the neighboring sites, uh, neighboring buildings, sometimes that makes life a lot simpler, uh, particularly the rear yard, the roofs, whatever. Um, that you're not required under any circumstances to allow a contractor for your neighbor onto your property unless there's an emergency that you may have to. And I'm talking about for their logistics, absolutely not required. Um, again, if you can get something for it, maybe it's something, maybe it's something to trade. And uh, I've seen people say absolutely not. I've seen people say sure, why not? And both of them have worked and both of them have not worked. So it's very much on the uh, particular case at hand. Um, let me start with the second bullet point here. Uh, in theory, every party wall has a party wall agreement drawn up by a lawyer. Um, current party wall agreements tend to run 20 or 30 pages. Uh, 19th century, they were half a page. Biggest problem is that most of the old ones are, cannot be found. Um, if you see a row of houses on a side street on the west side, uh, that are all built on the same date by the same developer, by the same contractor, there is a party wall agreement for each one of the party walls. If you have 10 houses, you have nine party walls. That doesn't mean that any of those party wall agreements can be found. Um, in theory, when the house is sold, they go along with the paperwork, but they very often disappear. If you have a house that is, uh, a wall that is physically supporting the floor joists for two houses, um, and has been doing so since the 1880s, for example, it's a party wall. Uh, and if, if somebody tried to challenge that in court, say, no, this wall belongs to me because my survey says it's on my property, they would be laughed out of court. It is supporting both buildings. By definition, it's a party wall. Um, the other problem is that a lot of developers in the 19th century, I'm sure this is going to shock you, um, didn't use the best surveys. So the lot lines aren't always in the center of the wall where they're supposed to be. If you have that row of 10 houses, it's 200 feet wide on 10 20-foot lots, in theory, it's supposed to line up exactly. It may not. And it, they may have been built so that the half of the walls are entirely on one property. Uh, and there's nothing that can be done about that today. It's always been like that. An honest survey will recognize this fact and distinguish between the theoretical lot line and the actual physical separation of the buildings. Um, you are allowed under every party wall agreement I've ever seen and sort of under common sense law to extend the party wall up or down. You can build an extension on the roof, you can extend your cellar down and extend the party wall down. The party wall agreement will cover that extension, the same as it covers the existing building. Um, 
the walls separating brownstones tend to be eight inches at the upper floors. I've seen people get the idea that they have to stick to their side of the lot line and build a four inch extension wall up. This is idiotic. Uh, you build the full width of the wall. It's a party wall. Your neighbor has the right to attach to it, but you're allowed to build the full width of the wall. Similarly, to the topic of today's discussion, when you're extending that wall downwards, you do not underpin half the thickness of the wall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry about the words here, but you know, you do this long enough and you start to see people doing very silly things. You underpin the full thickness of the wall. You are extending it as a party wall. Um, and the new extension belongs to both buildings the same as the old extension did. Uh, it is actually dangerous to underpin half, a, half the thickness of a wall. Um, you, can, you can introduce a lot of out-of-plane bending that wasn't previously there, and unreinforced brick, particularly 120-year-old unreinforced brick, is not the material to have out-of-plane bending in. Um, as I said, section 33 of the build, uh, chapter 33 of the building code uh, discusses all sorts of things about construction, uh, this construction process, including protection, protection of adjoining property, is section nine of chapter 33. Um, this used to be, for everybody in the room who's not a design professional, we had a very large change of building code in 2008. We went from a purely homegrown building code to a uh, heavily modified version of the international building code used by pretty much every jurisdiction in the U.S. Um, so the way that chapter 33 is written and section 9 is written is somewhat different from, the old, from what's now called old code, which is the 1968 code, um, but it has basically the same idea. So the stuff I've been talking about regarding protection uh, is, is, in, is in there. Um, and again, for non-professionals in the room, the building code is the law that governs construction, design and construction. Um, but like all laws, there are always gray areas. People find ways to come up with an idea that the law does not cover. Um, so that's why there are DOB regulations, and it's clarification of the building code. It is providing uh, information about whatever gaps there might have been in the code. Um, so for, for example, the reason TPPN 1088 exists is that the 1968 building code said absolutely nothing about vibration of landmark buildings or historic buildings during construction. Um, and look, here's all the stuff I've been talking about. So section 33 on 9.3, you have to do that investigation of your neighboring buildings. And that is not landmark buildings, that's any building. Now, what that examination is varies. And again, if you're next door to a modern high rise and you're altering a brownstone, the odds of you being able to affect its foundations are pretty small. But you are supposed to do an examination of it. Um, you have to do a, an actual survey, and there, the building code is distinguishing between an examination and a survey, uh, before you do excavation work, and then they define you know, when, how much excavation triggers this. If you're digging a hole for a fancy flower pot, no, you don't need to do a survey for that excavation. Um, if you have a relatively shallow excavation within 10 feet of your neighboring building, you have to do it, or if you're going down 10 feet or more anywhere on your property. Um, they say it to be performed by the construction team, but it's refused access. This is what I described. I don't recommend refusing access for the, for the reasons I, I talked about in terms of uh, the way that this thing will work. If you need the survey, right? Think of that. If everything goes perfectly, if there's never any damage to your building, you don't need the survey. The survey was wasted time. That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is your building gets damaged. And now suddenly the survey is very important because the survey is going to be the basis of figuring out how much damage was caused by the, by the construction. There's no such thing as a brownstone with no interior damage or no exterior damage. I can walk into any brownstone and find something and it drives the owners crazy because I'm like, where did that crap come from? And they never saw the crack. They've been living there for 20 years. There's always some existing damage. The point of a survey is to distinguish between damage that exists before the construction and damage that, that triggers Everybody running around screaming, you've damaged my building. Um, so you don't want that responsibility. You want that to be on the people doing the construction. There's also a separate point, and that is, and this is going to amuse everybody who knows me personally, um, I don't really believe in starting off looking for conflict. Uh, conflict may happen, and if it happens, it happens. 
but you should at least start the process trying to get along with your neighbor because you know what? They're your neighbor, you're stuck with them. So try being reasonable at the beginning. There's always time to be unreasonable later. <laughs> Um, and of course, anybody who performs a survey should, should, should be sharing it with the neighbors. Um, so vibration and movement monitoring. And again, movement is steady state in one direction, or it doesn't have to be in one direction, but steady state movement uh, versus vibration, which is, which is uh, temporary shaking. Of all adjacent buildings have to be monitored. And okay, so what does adjacent mean? Um, in the building code, it's the buildings abutting your site. In TVP on 1088, it's anybody within 90 feet. Now, 90 feet is a sort of interesting number here because the typical Manhattan side street is 60 feet wide. So if you draw a 90-foot radius around a, a row house in a mid-block location on the west side where all the mid-block buildings are row houses, you may be monitoring 15, 16 buildings. Um, which, guess what? Nobody ever does. That's what, the, that's what the rule says. What everybody has been doing for years is monitoring their immediate neighbors. And as long as those are OK, they assume that the buildings further away are OK. Uh, for vibration monitoring, that's not a terrible idea. It's pretty reasonable. Um, for movement, it has proven to be problematic. And the DOB now sometimes rejects monitoring plans if they don't show buildings further away. So keep in mind, you're, you're in the middle of a block on West 88th Street, um, you have your neighbors to the left and right, to the east and west, you have your neighbors across the street, you have your neighbors on 89th Street. Um, you have a lot of buildings to be monitoring. And this is me getting ahead of my slides. I've talked about a lot of this. So again, TPPN 1088 only talks about landmark buildings. I cannot emphasize the, the bottom bullet point on this slide enough. If you're talking about a brownstone, an actual brownstone, as opposed to you know a 1950s two-family house in Queens, if you're talking about a real old row house, you should be following the, this regulation regardless. And I'll talk about uh, what the actual regulations are in a minute. Um, because the building doesn't know if it's landmark or not. And uh, Nadal and I have worked on a number of projects together, and a number of times we've, he's been working for the people doing the construction that I've been working for, the people next door, and I think we agree on this one. Um, so here is, in case anybody cares, the regulation for noise control. Uh, I'm going to disappoint you all and say that during the workday, people are allowed to make a lot of noise. You're not going to get a construction site to pull back very much by complaining about noise um, if it's during ordinary business hours. Uh, they do. They are supposed to have, you know, some way of controlling the noise, um, and in theory, that could cause uh, trouble for people doing construction. But you know, given how loud construction sites are, and, and this is never flagged, I, mean, I don't know what kind of noise you'd have to make to actually run into trouble. Um, so those are sort of all of the the, the aspects of things we're looking at. Um, I just want to talk about aspects of the buildings themselves as opposed to aspects of, what I was talking about before is aspects of uh, construction protection. Let me just actually come back to this for one second. Um, the building code sets a maximum of two inches per second peak particle velocity, which means nothing to those of you who haven't dealt with this issue, but just trust me on this. That's the maximum amount of vibration you're allowed. TPPN 1088 for landmark buildings says half an inch per second, 25% as much. Uh, I recommend that level for any 19th century construction and for quite a bit of early 20th century construction. Similarly, um, the, the amount of movement you're allowed is, is more restrictive in 1088 than it is in the building code. Um, Nadal is going to be talking about this at somewhat greater length. Uh, for those of you who, who have not seen this before, this is called the Veely map, named after an engineer named Egbert Veely, which is my second favorite 19th century name after Balthazar Kreischer. Um, what Mr. Veely did was take a, his, his best understanding of the pre-colonization geography of Manhattan Island and draw the street grid as it existed at his time. And he, there's several versions of this. Like this is, the, I believe, the 1865 version. 
um, he drew the street grid on top of the original topography. His original topography is not exact. There's no way it could be exact. By the time he was doing this, we already had 200 years of people tinkering with the natural topography. Um, since it's a little bit blurry, here's Central Park. This is the west side, Manhattan Square, where the Museum of Natural History is. Look, where the reservoir is, is a swamp. Maybe Olmsted actually knew what he was doing. Um, <laughs> as you can see, there are a lot of little hills and little creeks and streams all over the west side, all of which are, of course, long since gone. Um, what they did when they built the street grid in Manhattan was simply chop off the top of the hills and take the, the spoil and throw it into the valleys to level out the ground. If you think about it, Manhattan has very few sharp hills. We have a lot of very gentle rises and drops. This is showing fairly sharp hills. Well, they all got leveled when the street grid got built. And if you go searching, you can find photographs and drawings of A, a house up on top of a little outcrop where the street's been cut through and somebody had to build a stair to get down to their house, uh, down from their house. And um, on the Upper East Side, uh, where the ground level was raised, um, there, there were hollows. The streets were 15 feet above the ground in the middle of the block, and the streets were built before there were any buildings. So there were these big block-sized hollows. I've seen some, not photographs, but engravings uh, of people farming down in there. So this is what the ground was before we built the west side. Well, it really stinks if your house is right here. <laughs> and sometimes it is. So one of the issues that comes up is why do I have a persistent leak? Uh, and what does it mean if my neighbor's building next door to me? Well, you may have a persistent leak because you're on top of an old stream or in an old swamp. The, the, the wider green areas are swampy ground. Uh, and there's a lot of that downtown. Um, this map, by the way, if anybody is interested, is available on the Library of Congress website. It's a very large TIFF file. It's like 250 megabytes um, because it's very detailed. And what's fascinating about it is that if you look at it closely, the areas that flooded during Hurricane Sandy are almost exactly the areas that are landfill post-1624. Um, like where we're standing and where my office is. Uh, you may have a persistent water problem because there's a water main leaking in the street. You may have a persistent water problem because there's a sewer leaking in the street. Uh, one thing that you can do, I should point out, is test the water. And if it has, if it has fluoride in it, it's from a water main. And if it has fecal matter in it, it's from a sewer. And if it has neither, maybe it's from a stream. Uh, it's not the most exact thing in the world. But if you test the water, you can get some, if you have a persistent leak, you can get some idea of where it's coming from. Um, if it is a stream and your neighbor is building a big underground space, they may change the natural water flow and they may increase the water in your cellar, increase the water leaking into your cellar. And I guess there's almost nothing you can do about that in terms of stopping them because you'd have to prove that this were true ahead of time. And how are you going to do that? It's not, not possible. So, um, you would have to prove that your neighbor building their project is going to increase the water flow inside your cellar when A, you don't know that it will, B, you don't necessarily know which direction the water is flowing. You know, there's all sorts of unknowns. How are you going to be able to prove that before it's built? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, anyway, natural ground conditions, uh, something to, to think about. And, and I should point out that one of the services that a geotechnical engineer provides you, him, not me, um, is telling you what the natural conditions, soil conditions in your, on your site are. Um, any of you on Brownstone, you've seen this. Uh, that is a rubble wall. Um, it's actually a rubble <coughs> wall that has a minor problem, but that's a whole other story. Uh, I just wrote, wrote this up a couple of days ago. If you put yourself in the position of a builder in the 19th century, keep in mind that Brownstones were speculative uh, suburban housing. They were basically Levittown. So they weren't being built to the highest possible standard of the year. They were being built cheaply to get them built and sold to people who wanted the house. Um, you can't use brick for a foundation wall unless it's between two cellars because brick will decay very quickly if it's constantly exposed to water. Um, the two commonly used, well sorry, the three commonly used building stones in New York City in the 19th century or brownstone, which is terrible stone and falls apart if it's constantly wet, granite, which is extremely hard to work, and limestone, which was you know, sort of in between brownstone and granite. It was 
it's stronger than brownstone, but um, not so easy to work. And also expensive. It was a, limestone is a veneer stone, it's something you use where people are going to see it. It's very pretty. Uh, the other stone that was available was schist. And the reason schist was available is that that's where our bedrock is. So any place somebody was, you know, dug a hole in the ground and they hit rock, they were pulling out schist. So, lo and behold, a lot of foundations in the 19th century are built of schist. Um, somebody else's garbage is always cheap. And um, <laughs> schist is very hard to work. It's a hard stone, but its properties vary very much depending on which direction you go at it. If you try to cut it to square corners like you would, you know, your picture of a, your mental picture of a stone block, if you try to do that with schist, it's going to have a tendency to fracture all over the place. So people didn't try. They just did this. And as you can see, there's Every stone is a different size. They're not, they don't necessarily have right angles. They don't necessarily have uh, sharp corners. This is actually better than most. This is actually a decent looking uh, rubble wall. My next slide is a little less so. Um, but because the stones are so irregular, you need very thick mortar beds. And the stone is not particularly porous, but the mortar is. Um, particularly you're using lime mortar, which is what people were mostly using. Uh, so what happens over time is that the uh, lime washes out because it gets wet and you're left with a lot of sand that looks like mortar from a distance, but you get up close you start scraping at it and you realize your wall consists of rubble and sand and the, the mortar isn't really mortar anymore. Um, wonderful thing, that's what your house is sitting on. Depends on where the water table is. Here is a rubble wall and as you can see here the rubble is more rounded um, that has been I'm going to call it lime washed. Who knows what that actually is? Uh, on the inside face, and at the bottom, you're seeing the stone. The, the wash has gone away, and that is what's called uh, what's called rising damp. It's capillary action. It's water coming up through the porous mortar from the wet ground, and it only can come up so high. So you get a very definite elevation below which is wet and above which is more or less dry. Uh, there's nothing that can be done about this. I mean. To water, it's impossible to waterproof one of these walls without, at the very least, access to the other side and realistically access to the bottom face. So these walls are, are you know, if this is what you've got, this is what you're always going to have. Uh, I'm just full of cheer today. Um, you need to, every so often, replace your mortar. You need to go in there and repoint this wall, deep repoint it, replace that mortar because if it falls apart, your wall falls apart. Um, we're in a situation where you have you know, a very nice house with brick and some kind of veneer, usually brownstone, uh, above grade, but it's sitting on this rubble, and this is what's there. Um, the other problem related to excavation, guess what? This stuff doesn't do very well when you disturb it. Uh, it, it does much less well than a brick wall would. So. This is the worst possible material to have when you're underpinning or when somebody's excavating next door. And when we're talking about brownstones, this is exactly what you have when somebody's underpinning or excavating next door. So we have sort of the worst possible scenario. Somebody's trying to alter uh, a wall that is not particularly strong to begin with. Um, the other thing that happens, and this happens even without excavation next door, but I think it's worth putting it in that context, uh, as the, the mortar weakens because the, the lime is washing out of it and you're losing the binding in the mortar, the rubble wall sort of compacts downwards a little bit. Not necessarily all that much, but some. It can, it, with that, the bottom isn't sinking. People say to me, oh, my house is settled. No, the bottom hasn't moved. The wall in your cellar got shorter from top to bottom. Um, you want to know the fastest way to accelerate that kind of damage? Vibrate it. So when you have a lot of vibration next door, even if it's not, even if there isn't overall movement that's worth measuring, it's a tiny amount of overall movement, but you have a lot of vibration, this kind of construction rubble walls may, may squash down a little bit. And when they do, you get the exact kind of damage up above from settlement that you would have had without the settlement actually taking place, uh, which can be a little difficult to tease out. You, know, you have to say, well, why is this happening? The foundation didn't settle at all. Um, believe it or not, it's not the hole in the wall that I want you to look at in this picture. Hole in the wall. I, I made the hole in the wall. Um, what I want you to look at is that. 
that is a two by four embedded in the wall. Uh, this is a row house actually in Brooklyn Heights, but I hope you'll forgive me using a Brooklyn example. Uh, the, there was a two by four at every floor at that location to nail the baseboard molding to. Well, the problem is that the wall was 12 inches thick. And if you put a two by four on each side of it, you have now four inches in the middle, which is one width of brick. So your wall really gets very skinny a few inches above the floor, which is a terrible thing. And it was built in 1860, so what am I going to do about it? People next door to this building in the 1920s converted the row house to an apartment house. And what they did was try to even out the parlor floor and basement heights. So the basement apartment had a higher ceiling and the parlor floor ceiling was effectively made lower. The parlor floor came up, which meant that this wall that has this horrible weak spot in the middle was no longer braced properly on both sides. So when I got there, uh, well, this is one point. This is, I'm showing this, this is actually a chimney foot, but Notice the way the wall is doing that? When I got there, that 12-inch wall was 8 inches out of plumb in places, which is actually technically in collapse. Um, and I was trying to figure out why. And then I saw that one, you know, piece of wood. Ordinarily, the narrower strips that are used to hold lath for plaster are tiny things. They're a quarter of an inch by half an inch, something like that. This builder used full two-by-fours. Um, and again, created, a, created all sorts of fun for lawyers later on. Uh, the, the neighbor basically said, you're accusing us. And I said, I'm not accusing you. I'm accusing the guy in 1920 who altered your building, which wasn't you because you're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, really, didn't listen. Um, and this is the other problem that you're going to find, which is, so this is that same building. This is the new wall we built. <laughs> Um, and in the process, we said, hey, look at that incredibly large chimney flue. That's why the wall is buckling at this particular area. Uh, the chimney, typically uh, an old-fashioned chimney flue in a row house, has a series of cells, and each one is the flue for a different fireplace. So you have a flue here and a flue here, and this is a little brick wall separating them. Well, the one width of brick that separated the interior of the house from the flues separated from that separation wall, as you can see. And you see off on the right the wood bracing that we had to try to hold it in place so it wouldn't collapse. Uh, the floors of the building were actually in good condition. And what we were afraid of is that if the brick collapsed in an uncontrolled fashion, it would destroy the floors, and we would no longer have anything worth talking about. So this is us trying to save that wall as it's, that has already failed. It's not failing. It's failed long enough to be able to rebuild it. Maybe you can see the rebuilding coming in from the left. So um, you have, on both sides of your property, if you own a row house, chimney flues. And if they have not been used in a long period of time and they're not capped, almost certainly the masonry is deteriorating on the inside because water is coming in, which matters relative construction. Because again, anyone want to take a guess what's the fastest way to make this situation worse? Vibrate it. So. Um, this is, that's it. I keep coming back to this house because this stuff is just so ridiculous. This is uh, the lower floors of the house have what's called a row lock wall. It's a way of making a wall a little bit thicker without spending more money on brick. You have a hollow in the center of the wall and bricks spanning across it. So you've got one face of brick, another face of brick, there's a header, there's a header, tying it together. And this is the wall that was left un improperly braced by uh, 1920s alterations. Vibrate this and it falls apart. The very last thing I want to talk about, um, so I've been talking about the building proper. You have a rear yard of some kind. Although actually, we actually did a project not that long ago on a house in Ranch Village that literally had no rear yard, which in some ways made things easier, but not very much. Um, you may have fences on three sides. You may have, as you see here, um, two illegal extensions on the neighboring property. Uh, the one that's covered with, with tan stucco and then the one that's painted white. Um, and, you know, you, your house may have the illegal extensions that were built in 1940 and therefore they were there when you bought the house and I'm not blaming you for it. But what happens when someone wants to do construction immediately adjacent to the property line? This, this, these extensions are not built even to the rather low standards of, an, of a 19th century row house. What happens when you have a fence where the fence posts go down six inches into earth and somebody wants to excavate their rear yard next to it. Can't underpin that thing. 
can't underpin a fence, it'll fall down. Um, so there's always the issue of if somebody is excavating in the rear yard, you have typically some minor structures. Fences are the most common, um, things like this are the second most common. Uh, you, I mean, people have done all sorts of weird things in the rear yard. Uh, you may have a great barber. Um, so the question is, how is this stuff dealt with? What the contractors want to do is demolish it all and build it back at the, at the end of the end. Now for a fence, that usually works. For a great barber, it might work. For, the, for this, these two extensions seen here, it won't work because that's a piece of somebody's house. So the issue, and then, um, this is a lead-in from the doll, the issue becomes how do you protect this very fragile, almost certainly illegal when it was built structure against earth movement next door? And there's no simple answer to that. Uh, because this, just, this is something that the building code says shouldn't exist to begin with. It's too fragile, um, and it's not so easy to deal with. So uh, we're going to have a long Q&A at the end. I hope that sort of gave you an overview of the way I approach looking at these issues and the doc.